the majority uh, the majority of our attendees will be joining us from Muskoka and Halliburton County. So the following land acknowledgement will be somewhat general in nature. We acknowledge that we all live on lands from which Indigenous peoples were dispossessed by colonialism. We honour all Indigenous peoples for their cultures, their languages, their wise teachings and ways of being. We respect their stewardship and protection of the lands and waters and life that have shaped this land since time began. The intent and spirit of the treaties that form the legal basis of Canada bind us to share the land for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. This evening, two organizations are collaborating to make this presentation possible, Environment Halberton and the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed. We both depend on your support to continue working to keep our beautiful lakes and forests healthy. I'm now going to ask Terry Moore, Vice President of Environment Halberton, to describe how the, uh, our presentation will unfold and introduce our speaker. So over to you, Terry. Thank you, Susan. So I could, if, if I can ask you to admit people for the next little while, that would be great, anyone who's joining late. Before I introduce uh, tonight's presenter, Dr. Norman Yan, I want to take a I want to say a couple of things about the Q and A period that will follow Norman's presentation. Um, first, on the Q and A process, we would really like you to put any comments or questions you have regarding any aspect of of Dr. Yan's presentation in the chat box function that you can access at the bottom of your page. While Norman is speaking, I'll be monitoring the comments and, and questions. And once he's finished, I'll start working my way through what you've placed in the chat box. I may put some questions together if they uh, cover similar themes or, or similar topics. Um, now about tonight's topic, hazardous algal blooms. Uh, tonight is one of a continuing series of discussions Environment Halliburton has, has sponsored or co-sponsored in relationship to shoreline health lake water quality and the protection of natural spaces essential to building resilience and protecting biodiversity in a time of cascading ecological crises and a climate emergency that gathers more steam by the day. It is certainly no secret that the incidence of blue-green algae blooms has been increasing in both Muskoka and in Halliburton at the same time as the capacity of public agencies like the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, as well as public health units to respond to that, to that reality has been declining. Tonight's presentation by Dr. Yan is about broadening our understanding of the science related to hazardous algal blooms, what we know, what we don't know, as well as the efforts to fill knowledge gaps while taking action to minimize risk at the same time. Dr. Yan has devoted more than 50 years to studying the human impact on Ontario's lakes and how that damage can either be arrested <laughs> mediated or reversed. Norman did his master's of science uh, on the effects of acid rain on the microscopic plants in the lake, the phytoplankton, and his PhD has uh, centered on the effects of metals on animal plankton, what he likes to refer to as the living lawnmowers in our lakes. In 2000, Dr. Yan established a research partnership with York University, uh, his new employer, and the Ministry of the Environment, and broadened his research to include impacts introduced by predators, ozone depletion, climate change, road salt, and calcium decline in our lakes. Retiring, in a manner of speaking, in 2014, Norman assumed a senior research scholar position at York University and chairmanship of the newly formed Friends of the Muskoka Watershed a charitable not-for-profit that fosters understanding, choices, action, and wise management needed to protect Muskoka's lakes and watersheds into the future. Having co-authored over 200 scientific articles and partnered in over, uh, in garnering over 11,000 scholarly citations, provincial national awards for research excellent, excellence, Norman was introduced into the Academy of Science of the Royal Society of Canada in 2012. We can't think of anyone we'd rather have share the latest on hazardous algal blooms, what they teach us and what we can learn to do about them, than Norman Yan. Please join me in extending a warm Halliburton and beyond welcome to a remarkable academic activist still going strong after all these years. Welcome, Norman. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And can you... Screen two. Can, have I managed to successfully share my screen? Not yet. Hmm. 
lot of people have problems with it. Says in screen two. There we go. It's coming up now. Perfect. Oh, okay. You're in a court meeting, you're in a meeting. I can't. Alice, that's it. Muted something. Okay, is that working? Yeah, just before you start, Norman, I'm hearing some noise in the background. So I'm going to ask anybody, because I can't see everybody now, but if everybody could mute themselves, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Terry, for that lovely introduction. If you can share it with me, I'll give it to my wife, Sandy, to convince her that I'm not wasting my time in retirement. <clears throat> okay, hazardous algal blooms. Who would have thought we'd be talking about this again? So what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you why it might be happening, but I confess I'm going to admit that there are many possible explanations and we're not quite sure yet. And then I'll talk about what we can do to fill that knowledge gap. Um, let me start, though, with a few acknowledgments, because this really goes back over 20 years of my, of my past work. So let me acknowledge, first of all, my colleagues at the Dorset Environmental Science Center and uh, the District of Muskoka, York University, Queen's University, students at York, uh, board members and staff of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, two of them who are on the call. Um, we've had funding from on the Ontario Trillium Foundation, but NSERG and the Ontario government have also helped. More importantly, hundreds, probably over a thousand Muskoka residents have been working with Friends of the Muskoka Watershed on these efforts. Uh, I'll thank Sandy again, who I've already mentioned, and Terry and Environment Halliburton for the opportunity to talk. But I feel I also should acknowledge a couple of non-humans, the ones here on the right, uh, the water flea Daphnia, the little living lawnmower that Terry mentioned, uh, that I'll refer to a few times in the talk. And this is the little cute gal called Holopedium that I did my PhD on. So um, in my life's work over the last 40 years, I was hoping to learn the stories of these little non-human animals that we share the watershed with uh, so that hopefully I can protect them better. We live in a truly wonderful place and I had the great good fortune to work here at the Dorset Environmental Science Center for decades. <clears throat> and uh, there are very few places on earth that have this perfect kind of 10% of the landscape being water. It looks pretty wonderful from a distance, but as Terry pointed out, there are threats. Uh, and you're going to hear about these threats in the next half an hour, 45 minutes or so. Um, we don't yet have the knowledge to deal with all of these threats. The Friends of the Muskoka Watershed believe strongly that, uh, that we need to generate the knowledge, the science to drive solutions to these threats. So I'll be talking about what that means today. But, but briefly, Friends of Muskoka Watershed chooses environmental threats that are severe and widespread that the government isn't solving uh, and that the public can help solve. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that generates the good science that we need to help solve problems. And good science requires support that you heard about mentioned earlier, and both of our associations need that support. And I'll Later on in the talk, I'll tell you what it is that that support might actually do in terms of generating the knowledge that we need. So this is a talk about when algae go bad. Um, but let me start by telling you that the vast majority of the time, algae don't go bad. Um, there are thousands of species in our lakes. They come with all kinds of shapes and sizes. They all tend to be green. They have chlorophyll, thank heavens, because that photosynthesis using that chlorophyll generates the oxygen that transformed the earth so that we can crawl out of the ocean and actually populate the land. So <clears throat> the comment I'd like to leave you with early on is that we absolutely need algae. We'd be stupid, we'd starve, and we'd suffocate without them. 
We'd be stupid because the omega-3 fatty acids in our brain uh, initially come mainly from algae and we'd starve because half of the sugar, natural sugars produced in the world that feed fish come from algae and we'd suffocate, as I mentioned, because more than half the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from algae. And they are beautiful. Um, here is a little green algae called uh, desmond uh, that I think came from a pond behind a monastery in Quebec. Uh, this is the first name. It has a wonderful name, Microsterius Mahalubash Morensis. For some reason, I've never forgotten that name. The last thing before I get into the substance of the talk is to tell you that algae can actually be beautiful. Um, if you get your pencil out and write down, you should do a Google search for Victorian diatom art. This is not a photograph of a cathedral window in Austria. This is actually a photograph taken through a microscope slide. Um, hundreds of little shells of tiny diatoms arranged on a microscope slide. In the late 1800s, after microscopes uh, were first invented and became good quality, a small group of people that couldn't think of anything better to do started making art that could only be seen through a microscope. And here's an example of that art. So algae can be beautiful, um, but they can also do this. Um, algal blooms have been an enormous problem in the past. Uh, it's one of the four environmental threats that started the environmental movement in the world, along with acid rain and DDT and lead pollution from gasoline, the reported death of lakes all around the world, death caused by over life. Uh, algal soups like this, algae sinking to the bottom, consuming the oxygen, fish dying, occupied limnologists from the 1950s to about the 1980s, really trying to identify the cause. And Canadians were very involved in this. This is a photograph of a lake near Kenora, a lake called 226 in the experimental lakes area, which is one of the most important um, areas of science in the world. Uh, Canada was quite visionary in setting aside about 60 lakes from what was called whole lake manipulations. So one of the earliest questions they addressed is what is the cause of that green soup in lakes that we call eutrophication, overabundance of food. So what uh, the scientists involved here did, David Schindler and Everett Fee and their colleagues, is they found the lake, Lake 226. They put a barrier across a shallow area in the lake. And then they said, well, we know it's nutrients, but what nutrient is it? It could be carbon, it could be nitrogen, it could be phosphorus. So let's add carbon and nitrogen to both sides of the lake in the proportion that they are in algae, which is 100 parts carbon to about 15 parts nitrogen. They did this by adding thousands of bags of sugar uh, and hundreds of bags of sodium nitrate. You probably couldn't do that today because it's an explosive. Um, and then in this basin, they dribbled in a little phosphorus, one, per, one part phosphorus for every hundred parts carbon, and ended up producing an algal bloom. And this photograph has been called the most important photograph in applied ecology, because it led to the control of phosphorus in lakes all around the world. Uh, and every single time it worked. When you got rid of the excess phosphorus, algal blooms stopped happening. Here is an example that's much closer to home. Uh, levels of phosphorus in Muskoka Bay in the town of Gravenhurst. And we actually have 50 years of data of phosphorus levels in this lake. And in our grandparents' time, or actually in my childhood, as I first sampled this lake in 1971, I was out probably collecting that data point right there. Um, and it was an algal soup, uh, 40 micrograms per liter of phosphorus, uh, algal blooms every summer. Uh, and Muskoka Bay was one of the earliest case studies where phosphorus levels were lowered. And the benefits of lowering phosphorus was that there haven't been algal blooms in this lake 
since about 19, in the late 1970s. Um, <clears throat> so it's a really positive change. And many of you might be Lake Stewards. Um, Elizabeth Fabat working with uh, FOCA, uh, sorry, not FOCA, OFA, the, oh, sorry, FOCA, Federation of Ontario Cottagers Association, just put together a paper looking at what's happened to phosphorus in the last 20 years in 600 lakes. And it depends how much phosphorus was there. So this is a couple hundred lakes and there was no change. The average change was zero in lakes that already had low phosphorus. But at the other extreme, where lakes had more phosphorus, this is more than 30 micrograms per liter of phosphorus, there's been a dramatic reduction. So we've been working nonstop to lower the phosphorus level in lakes because of these early definitive studies that showed if you lower phosphorus, you won't have an algal bloom. And then this happened. This happened, and every limnologist in the world was shocked. Um, so this is a lake-wide bloom of a blue-green algae or a cyanophyte, cyanobacterium, um, <clears throat> uh, that used to be called anabina. It's got a fancier name now. In a lake that absolutely should not have algal blooms and probably hadn't had one in a thousand years. It's in the middle of Algonquin Park, for heaven's sakes. Uh, there's no farms, there's no agriculture. Um, there probably wasn't much in the way of, well, actually, I don't know about fish. I'm going to have to go back and, and see if brook trout were added to this lake. But there was no logging in the immediate watershed. And phosphorus level was less than 10 micrograms per liter. It's a complete shock to a limnologist that a lake like this would have a lake-wide algal bloom. And it turns out that um, Dixon Lake is not alone. Um, so if we go back, this is a, a graph taken from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Andrew Patterson from Dorset gave me this graph. It was actually put together by Claire Holton. And it's the number of algal blooms each year, going back uh, 25 years to the 90s. Um, <clears throat> and how that's changed over time up to 2016. We actually have data to 2019. In 2019, it's actually over 100. So you can see way back here why limnologists thought we had this problem solved. A quarter million lakes in Ontario, we had two confirmed algal blooms, right? But by the early 2000s, and ever since, things have been creeping up. And we now typically, as I said, by 2019, have about 100 algal blooms in Ontario lakes every year. And what's more disturbing is most of them are cyanobacteria, this kind of cyan-colored uh, portion of the bar. Uh, there's also a few more green algal blooms. This is the green part. But the big change is certainly the cyanobacteria. And um, many lakes are seeing their first ever algal bloom. Uh, confirmed. So that's really quite shocking that we now have 25 lakes a year that apparently have never had a bloom noted by residents on the lake that are now having them for the first time. And half of these lakes have phosphorus levels low enough uh, measured in the spring that we would never have predicted based on the 30-year-old knowledge that they should have a bloom. And so half of the lakes in Halliburton and Muskoka that are showing these blooms um, have phosphorus levels less than 10 micrograms per liter. So what the heck is going on here? Um, we thought we had this problem licked. Um, we apparently don't. Um, and so we need kind of to go back to first principles. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so is what else has been happening in Muskoka and Halliburton Lakes uh, that might be linked to algal blooms and what role might climate change also play? And given that, uh, and we need to open our minds here because our old knowledge won't be good enough. So we almost have to go back to first principles about what controls the abundance of any plant, let alone algae and lakes. So at that very general level, 
uh, a species of plant will have habitat preferences. It turns out that blue-green algae like the water to be calm. It gives them uh, a competitive advantage over heavier diatoms, which have this silica shell. They sink when the water is calm, but blue-green algae uh, can control their buoyancy. They are totally happy when oxygen levels are low. In fact, they are the ones that evolved initially when oxygen levels were really low and produced the oxygen, and they like it hot. So you ask yourself, might our waters be getting calmer and having lower oxygen and hotter? And if that's true, then that's probably good for blue-green algae. The phosphorus story has not gone away. We still know that if you add phosphorus to a lake that's limited by, where the plants are limited by phosphorus, you're going to get more algae. But what's not been considered historically is that the little living lawnmowers might have anything to do with it. Might we be doing things in lakes which are killing the animal plankton that eat the algae? And might that have something to do with the incidence of algal blooms? So here is what you might call a front lawn grass bloom. And if your lawn looked like this, your neighbors wouldn't be happy with you. And how your lawn gets to look like this is that you have good soil for the grass, you add fertilizer and you never mow. You know, you put the mower in the garage and then your neighbors give you a hard time. Well, that silly analogy has some relevance, I think, to legs. So where do legs get their nutrients? Um, well, they get it initially from the watershed and from the air. Uh, precipitation has about twice the phosphorus as a typical Muskoka or Halliburton lake. Uh, and that phosphorus is taken up by the trees and the plants in the watershed. So if you clear the land, uh, there's a greater chance that that phosphorus from the air will get into the lakes. And if you move all kinds of people in and they don't manage their uh, septic waste properly, you'll get more phosphorus in. And if you do something in the bottom of lakes that allows the sediments to release the phosphorus, there's a number of ways then that you could actually end up getting more phosphorus in lakes. But let's talk a little bit about uh, the lawnmowers. So here's a picture of Daphnia that I acknowledged and a couple of copepods. Um, I spent most of my life, professional life, working on these animals. Um, let's just say that they're very important for animals that we never give a second thought to. The entire volume of a typical Muskoka or Halliburton Lake is filtered uh, through the, the filtering appendages and the stomachs of the Daphnia every 10 days or so. So this Daphnia here has a green stomach because she has just filtered that day about 20 milliliters of lake water um, free of algae and taken up all the algae that she likes. And if, you, um, if we do anything to get rid of those in the lawnmowers, no, that algae will still be in the water. So let's think about this. The, you can get more algal blooms if the algae grow more or die slower. And the traditional view is that it was all about phosphorus. So, um, <clears throat> and there was good reason. You know, we did experiments, added phosphorus, we got algal blooms. And so we came to believe that if there was more development that produced waste that was uncontrolled or more clearing of land so that uh, the forest wouldn't capture the phosphorus out of the rain, or there might be more erosion, we'd get more phosphorus. And that story has even got a little richer of late, because we've learned that if you kill trees, the trees are about 1% phosphorus. And if they're killed, then you can lose that phosphorus as well uh, into lakes. But no one has given much thought to this side where you might end up uh, putting the little lawnmowers in the in the garden shed and end up with slower algal death. I'd like to talk about that for a few minutes. And I'm going to start with the spiny water flea, uh, which is a non-indigenous uh, predator of plankton that's probably around in our lakes with ballast water into the lower Great Lakes and spread north. Although there is a tiny possibility that they've been here since the fur trade and have come down from Hudson Bay. That is another intriguing 
possibility that I'm not going to talk about anymore today. What I will say is that, my God, we have a lot of them in Muskoka and Halliburton. I, I did a lot of work on this Spiny Water Flea 20 years ago, and I haven't really kept up with all this literature. But here's a recent distribution map from eight years ago from the U.S. Geological Survey of where the spiny water flea is in the Great Lakes Basin. And you can see these dense blue dots right in Muskoka and Halliburton with 20 or more invaded lakes. In fact, when I stopped keeping track uh, in about 2011, we had about 160 lakes in Ontario invaded by the spiny water flea. Well, why does that matter? Well, I'll tell you why it might matter. And that's that the spiny water flea is a, a predator on the little living lawnmowers, on the animal plankton that eat the algae that they have no experience with. So here is what happens. There's a lake called Harp Lake, east of Huntsville, that Ministry of the Environment has been working on out of Dorset since the 70s and what and <clears throat> our in, initially in, my interest in animal plankton 20 years ago was about recovery from acid rain so we sampled 40 lakes every month uh distributed along a ph gradient from five to seven five is, is acid seven is not acid anything above six there wasn't much going on we had about eight to 12 species per standard count Harp Lake, the solid squares, was right up where it should be in the midst of all these other lakes. And then the spiny water flea arrived. Post-invasion, there was a 40% reduction in the biodiversity of the native plankton. And actually, as a slight side issue here, 20 years on, um, animal plankton is recovering in Muskoka Lakes because Muskoka Lakes are recovering from acid rain except in the lakes that have low calcium or the spiny water flea. So spiny water flea is preventing the recovery of native biodiversity. Now, why might this matter for algal blooms? Well, I'm now going to take you down to um, Wisconsin, a lake called Lake Mendota. Um, and when the spiny water flea invaded Lake Mendota in Wisconsin, I actually got pretty excited because scientists know more about Lake Mendota's food web than almost any other lake in North America, because there's been a limnology institute on the shores of the lake for 100 years. So I said, OK, now we're going to really learn something that matters here. So what they had, uh, this is a paper about what happens when the spiny water flea invades a lake in the middle of a food web and eats the water fleas. And what happened was that there was a 25% loss of water clarity, a 25% increase in algae, because the little living lawnmowers had been put in the garden shed by the spiny water flea. So they weren't eating the algae at anywhere near the normal rate. What, what Walsh and his colleagues did in this paper that was intriguing is they said, OK, we value that water clarity that we've just lost. We can't get rid of the spiny water flea. How much would it cost us to lower phosphorus levels, phosphorus input to this lake, to recover that lost 25% of the clarity? How much would that cost us? And it worked out to be $140 million. So $140 million was the cost to an ecological service that the spiny water flea uh, impacted. Okay. So the first issue that we have to deal with is that we have spiny water flea in all kinds of lakes in Muskoka and Halliburton, and that is lowering the redundancy of the little lawnmowers to keep our lakes clean. I'd argue the second thing we have to worry about is road salt. So <clears throat> Ryan Soricetti uh, put together a big study on, on chloride levels in Muskoka lakes, uh, sorry, in all Ontario lakes, and um, uh, staff from the Dorset Environmental Sunny, uh, Science Center contributed to that because they had found a 40-year-old data set from 1983 here in yellow, sampling at eight points along the watershed from the Big East River and the Hollow River and the Oxtongue River high in the watershed to the outflow of Lake Muskoka uh, in uh, 
here in Vela and in Port Car and and uh, Port Carling and Bracebridge. So what they showed was chloride levels in that 40 year period had declined high in the watershed, declined by almost 100%. And that's typical of what we see in undeveloped lakes. But in all the developed lakes, further down in the watershed, chloride levels had actually decreased. Now, we can quantify that beautifully in Lake Muskoka because we have this 50 year old data set. And, we act, and the guy that generated this data set, Michael Mikowski, is retired in Bracebridge. It's quite remarkable. We can talk to the scientists that generated this data set 50 years ago. In fact, I called him up and asked him about it. Are you comfortable? Were you measuring chloride properly? How many samples were taken? So we know that back in 1969 in Muskoka Bay, we had half a milligram per liter of chloride. Today, it's almost 20. And in the main part of the lake, we had less than that, 0.3 milligrams per liter of chloride. And today, it's 30 times higher. Uh, what this means if with this number is that we have roughly 30,000 tons of road salt in Lake Muskoka today. And because Lake Muskoka flushes once a year, this actually means there's about 30,000 tons of road salt entering the lake every year. But, you know, should we care about six or 18 milligrams per liter of chloride? There's a remarkable range in chloride levels across Muskoka. The district has sampled 160 odd lakes and there's a 700 fold range in chloride in that 160 legs from about 0.2 up to over 100. Um, so Muskoka Bay at 18 would be right about here in the top 20th percentile. Do we care about 10 milligrams per liter of chloride? Well, I think we should. Uh, Shelley Arnott, a professor at Queen's University, <clears throat> and she was my first postdoctoral fellow, it's always wonderful for teachers if their um, if their students exceed what they themselves did as teachers. And Shelley has certainly done that, organizing a global alliance of people working on road salt. So in the lab up the road from uh, Halliburton in Dorset, she and her postdoc Martha uh, got six different species of Daphnia in culture and exposed them all to chloride in soft water at high food and found that the two most abundant species we have, they're called cat and men. It's actually Daphnia catawba and Daphnia mendoti, named after Lake Mendota in Wisconsin. 10 to 20 milligrams per liter of chloride killed half these animals in the lab under ideal conditions, except for the chloride. So the Canadian Water Quality Guideline, which is 120, absolutely doesn't protect typical soft water nutrient poor Muskoka lakes. So 20% of our lakes have more than 10 milligrams per liter of chloride in Muskoka. And this lab work suggests that the little living lawnmowers are put in the garden shed and they're no longer there to be eating um, the algae. Do we have any evidence that algae abundance will actually increase? And the answer is, Yes. Now, here's the kind of slide I never would have let any one of my students ever put in a talk uh, because there's so much information on it. <clears throat> but I think it's so clear here that I, we can get away with it. This is a study with all these co-authors led by Shelley Arnott. She's the second author here. And she convinced 16 different groups around the world in Europe and the United States and Canada to do the same experiment at the same time, which is to take a whole bunch of 100 liter containers, fill them with natural lake water with their algae and their natural animal plankton, and vary the chloride from zero up to 1500. That's what's on the x-axis in every case. And on the y-axis is what happened in black, the black line, to the abundance of the little living lawnmowers. In every single case, whoops, in every single case, 
Um, the little living lawnmowers were creamed by the addition of salt. And what you can't see here, because it's too small, is this is a logarithmic scale. So this is a tenfold change, a hundredfold change. In this case, 10, 100, 1,000 fold change. And in every, so in every single case, salt was bad for the little lawnmowers. And what the green is, is the abundance of algae. So in pretty well every case, after the little living lawnmowers were put in the garden shed, uh, the algae increased in abundance. And the algae were much more tolerant of road salt than uh, the animal plankton were. Only in a few cases like here or here, at the very end did the salt levels get high enough that the algae were actually damaged. So number one, uh, you let the spiny water flea, a predator on the animals, colonize, and that's bad. Number two, uh, you have enough road salt getting into lakes, more than 10 milligrams per liter, and that can also harm the animal plankton and lead to more algae. And finally, there's what we call um, osteoporosis, or widespread calcium decline. Again, going back to the Dorset lakes, this is their seven major study lakes. There's been a 40% decline in calcium over the last 40 years. What's more important is not the percentage decline, but the absolute level. At two milligrams per liter of calcium and below, uh, Daphnia start dying. We're again putting the little lawnmowers in the garden shed. And when I started working at Dorset in the early 80s, None of the main study lakes had calcium less than two, but now six of the eight main study lakes have calcium levels less than two, and the little water fleas are being damaged. And all across Muskoka, we have lakes uh, with less than two milligrams per liter of calcium. Anything that's red here, anything that's red is a lake that has uh, calcium levels less than two milligrams per liter. Okay, so let's go back to this. Historically, we only cared about phosphorus, but I think opening our minds, things have got a little more complicated. Uh, the arrival of the spiny water flea, the use of road salt, and the decline of lake calcium, a legacy of acid rain, are all straining animal plankton populations in Halliburton and Muskoka, and we saw in that amazing 16 panel plot, that that can lead to more algal abundance. And then there's climate change. Uh, most of you will have seen this plot, CO2 levels rising rapidly. Uh, global temperatures uh, now about a degree higher than uh, they were in the 50s to the 80s. Um, uh, Terry, I mentioned Sapna Sharma, you know, before we started, she put together this data set of lake temperatures from 240 lakes around the world. The redder the dot, the more those lakes are warming at the surface. Um, uh, there's a brilliant water flea scientist called um, Lampert, uh, Winfried Lampert, and he kept many different kinds of Daphnia in his lab. And this is from his work of many years ago, showing that Daphnia grow better when temperature rises up to maybe the mid twenties and nothing, and then they start thinking twice about it. And when the temperature hits 28, 29, they start crashing, they can't take it. When I arrived in Muskoka many years ago, we never had lakes that were 28 degrees in the summer. We're actually seeing that in the surface waters of lakes now, hitting unheard ofly warm temperatures. And other things are happening with climate change. Um, this is, I live just up here. This is the spring flood in Bracebridge a couple of years ago that did damage to 1500 properties, ended several businesses, because there was so much erosion in the Delta of the Muskoka River that the big boats can't get out into the lake anymore. Um, I took another picture standing right there. Here's that picture looking back at the waterfall. You can see the erosion. You can see all this water coming up on the land. So that might lead to more phosphorus uh, getting out. It certainly has lead, led to more erosion. Uh, 
The other thing we're getting is more lake effect snow. So here's an amazing image from <clears throat> NOAA of a lake effect snow event across the Great Lakes. Here's Sault Ste. Marie being creamed, the whole eastern shore of Lake Michigan being creamed. Here's poor Buffalo right here, poor Syracuse over here. Here's poor Muskoka Halliburton over here. Um, Aurelia, for some reason, Barry escaped this one. Um, more lake effect snow because lakes are warmer in the fall. And when you have more lake effect snow in Muskoka, we use more salt. Um, now, this is a little complicated, but I think it matters. We can also have multiple stressor interactions. Um, one of my last master's students um, was Don Ashford, and she wanted to work on the interaction of calcium and global warming. So we did an experiment in the lab and we looked at the number of babies of Daphnia being produced. Uh, and what you first see is that they all died at, in distilled water and they all died in hot water. At 32 degrees, there's no bars here. They tended to like uh, 24 more than 20. You know, they produced more babies, although it wasn't significant. But from 24 to 28, there was a big crash. 28 degrees, they didn't do well. And the lower the calcium, low calcium exaggerated that response. So in hot water, cal low calcium is even more damaging to animal plankton. And then there's some counterintuitive changes. Uh, Lou Malat at York University worked up data from Washa Yao at the MECP on the number of windy days in the summer. If you're a sailor, you may have noticed there's no good sailing weather anymore. It's either calm or incredibly windy. So this line here is the number of windy days in June, July, and August from the late 70s to 2014. And it went from an average of about 50 to an average of about 10. And here's 2014. 2014, the year of the algal bloom in Dixon Lake, the entire summer was calm. There wasn't a single windy day for three months. Um, this is called atmospheric stilling, and it's a counterintuitive consequence of climate warming that's been documented all around the Northern Hemisphere and something that we need to be very aware of. So can we imagine that this combination of stressors coupled with climate change might be somehow leading to these new algal blooms. And I think this is more like a research agenda uh, that we should embark on. So <clears throat> climate change can end up damaging animal plankton that eat the algae because we use more salt because there's more lake effect snow. Whoops, the water itself just gets hotter. There can be increased damage from low calcium. And half of the lakes in Muskoka have less than two milligrams per liter of calcium, low enough that the little animal plankton are being put in the garden shed. We might, you know, we might have with more erosion from more floods, uh, we might end up with more phosphorus. And because it's calmer and the surface waters are warmer, the legs turn over later in the fall. And they so it gives them more chance to become anaerobic, and that might release more phosphorus from the sediments. And then things are just getting better for blue-green algae. Warmer water, lower wind speeds, later fall overturn. So climate change has a role to play here that's very complicated. This slide is like a research agenda for 10 years for a whole bunch of students. So more uh, lake effects, no more road salt. Low calcium becomes more damaging. Hot water itself can kill animals. Later fall overturn uh, leads to more anoxia and more phosphorus. More damaging windstorms between these periods of calm that can lead to uh, blowdown of trees, and we certainly have more severe spring floods. So what the heck do we do? Uh, I'm in the finishing uh, five or 10 minutes here, Terry. So fix the problems we do understand and study those we don't yet understand to generate the knowledge of what to do. Good science 
takes real money. And we're at a point now where we have to revisit what we thought we understood 30 years ago and do good science again. There are some things now that seem to me to be simpler. In Halliburton, our leaders in fixing faulty septic systems. So we just need to do that. You know, we need policies and regulations to make sure septic systems are working, especially as more and more people are coming here in the summer. We need to find a way to reduce salt use. For instance, Skokie Watershed is very involved um, with a number of lake associations to try and make this change, to figure out where the, uh, the majority of salt is coming from, although we think we know, and then work with municipalities uh, to try and, uh, you know, still be safe, have people be safe in the winter, but reduce the use of salt uh, and prevent new introductions. <clears throat> the one I'm worried about in probably 10% of Halliburton lakes is the Starry Stonewort, because you have a few hard water lakes we don't uh, in Muskoka. And then there's two little calcium. This is how Friends of the Muskoka Watershed got started, and we're at the point now where we're starting to roll out ash additions at a larger scale in Muskoka. But we still need a lot of support for that because we have a thousand people giving us ash and they need to be managed. And then there's the problems we don't understand. So um, I feel pretty strongly that the, even though we generate some pretty darn good data in the District Water Quality Monitoring Program in Muskoka and the Lake Partner Program generally, we're not generating the data we really need to predict when and where these blooms will occur. We need real-time, continuous monitoring in areas of the lake that we don't generally sample. These blue-green nursery areas, areas that are 5 to 10 meters deep, that's not too deep for blue-green algae to go down during calm periods, get phosphorus, uh, and come back up and start a bloom. What Friends to Muskoka Watershed is attempting to do right now is to raise the support um, <clears throat> to put out a series of sensor strings like this one that are measuring conductivity and turbidity and temperature and oxygen in a suite of lakes that range in vulnerability to algal blooms so that we can parameterize this equation the probability of an algal bloom, how is it a function of the wind and the day of fall mixing and surface and bottom temperatures and the bathymetric characteristics of the lake and what the grazers are doing at that time. There's a bunch of things we need to measure. We are hoping to raise $170,000 over the next couple of years to buy a few of these sensor arrays. I'll just remind you that real science costs real money. But only if we can predict the actual circumstances that result in a bloom when, will we be ready to put in place the tools to try and prevent it from happening. And I absolutely believe that's possible. But we're a couple of years away from being able to do that. I also think we need to sample the water fleas with an aquatic version of a butterfly net. Um, you can make one of these for about $10. Uh, out of a Coke bottle and a pair of pantyhose. And it's fun. You could have a lot of fun with grandchildren, collecting hundreds of animals. Um, and then ultimately, five years from now, I'm hoping that we can test that model uh, to confirm the triggers. Hopefully in a Muskoka Halliburton New Limnology Institute um, that might be modeled after this one in Switzerland, uh, where you can actually say, okay, we think if the animal density is this and the calcium is this and the salt is this and the surface temperature is this, there should, should be an algal bloom. Can we actually prove that um, in an experimental setting? So once we have that model in place, uh, the idea then would be to identify lakes that are vulnerable uh, and work with lake associations to monitor those conditions ultimately to test how to prevent it from happening. And I believe there are ways to do that. If the, if the real mechanism is the return of phosphorus from sediments caused by um, <clears throat> later fall overturn 
and anoxia build up in the sediments. So I'm done. So uh, I'm here representing Friends of the Muskoka Watershed. Our vision, which I think is probably very close to yours, is healthy watersheds forever. And we approach this by generating the science needed for appropriate solutions. And that science should give us the understanding choices and actions that we can uh, apply to wisely manage our lakes and our watersheds, hopefully forever. Just for your interest, over the next five years, we're gonna be rolling out our ash work much more broadly, uh, including the first test in a whole watershed. We've got a 22 hectare watershed with one landowner that's very keen to have us add ash to the whole watershed. Uh, and it's a watershed where we have 40 years of stream data. So it'll allow us to test, can we restore historic carbon capture rates? And can we reduce the risk of the severity of spring flooding? We also, as I've talked today, want to identify the cause of algal blooms. Uh, and we want through our citizen science projects to continue building the will for action because generating the knowledge is one thing, but generating the will to have that knowledge used uh, is tougher than actually generating the knowledge itself. We also, although we don't have money for it yet, are starting to nibble at this issue of, of the hundreds of <clears throat> chemicals of risk, you know, which of them might we actually be concerned about in Muskoka? How can you help? There are many ways. You can become a member of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, FOTMW.org. Uh, we would love it if you could make a donation to us uh, or volunteer as a citizen scientist, maybe rolling out some of the work we're doing in Muskoka in Halliburton. Um, and certainly follow us. Uh, if you go to our brand new website, just being released actually today, which means there's probably going to be a few mistakes in it, uh, you can click on to get our newsletter and keep up with what we're doing. And I'm done. I thank you very much. I went a little bit over, Terry. I hope that's okay. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Norman. That that gave us, I think, a whole bunch of stuff to think about. And there's a a good a good start on um, on a conversation in the chat box. And so I'm going to go to that now. And if, I'm going to encourage people before I begin, if you've got any comments or, you, or any questions, now's the time to start putting them in the in the chat box, and we'll work our way through that. Um, we have at, uh, at least a half an hour of questions, if there are sufficient questions to justify that time. And Norman's actually agreed to stay a little longer if that if if the number of questions warrants that. So uh, please put your comments and questions into the chat box, and we'll we'll deal with them uh, in sequence. So um, so Jim Prince, uh, someone I think you who you you know, um, is asking: Should we be implementing a uh, hazardous uh, algae bloom? Uh, tracking program at Halliburton, and do you have a recommendation as to who might take the lead on that? Um, yes, I think it would be a good idea. Um, and, it, and the lead probably could be um, the Lake Association Environmental Stewards that you have now um, measuring calcium and phosphorus and spring secchi. The difficulty is they can happen any time of the year now. So we have them early in the year and then stretching right into the fall, we're getting algal blooms. Um, I see Lenore Innes on the, on the call still. She'd also recommend drones. It can be a wonderful way uh, to keep track of these algal blooms. So if there's someone in your extended community that would fly a drone flight across uh, lakes, that would be Amazing. So where to look? Where the these new blooms tend to start, and I'm using the example of Leonard Lake in Muskoka that has three basins, and the basin that goes anaerobic in the fall um, is not the standard Lake Partner Program sampling site because it's not the deepest. 
you know, we tend to always want to go to the deep hole in the lake and sample. In Leonard Lake, it's, I think, an eight meter deep basin. Um, and that is the one that's shallow enough, it tends to go anaerobic in the fall. And then it releases phosphorus. And it's and it's um, shallow enough that the blue green algae can go down and get that phosphorus. So if I um, take a look at your bathymetric maps, if there is especially kind of an isolated basin that's five to 10 meters deep, um, that's what I would call a blue-green nursery area. And they're not the areas that we tend to sample. Uh, and so I would talk to cottagers that live around those basins that have those characteristics uh, and ask them to keep an eye on whether they are uh, seeing any shoreline algal blooms. And the place to look, the algae would go down, pick up the phosphorus, come up, and then be kind of blown to shore. So it could start at the downwind end of these relatively shallow isolated bays is where you would first detect it um, if an algal bloom is starting. So I guess what you're saying is that one of the ways in which to get something like that going would be to, to tag it or to make it part, an integral part of the Lake Partner Program that many yeah. lake associations are already a part of. Yeah, the problem, I mean, the Lake Partner Program is fabulous. Um, the problem with it is, is it's designed to study a phenomenon that no longer describes what's happening. So, you know, spring phosphorus concentrations is the target, along with spring secchi. That's the target of our Lake Partner Program uh, going back decades. And that's not what's happening anymore. You know, what's happening is despite low spring phosphorus, we're still getting algal blooms. And so we need to rethink, you know, to some extent, how we're going to detect them and where they, what lakes uh, and what years are most vulnerable. So looking at the uh, Dixon Lake as an example, it was a calm year. Um, so calm years. But calm years in lakes that have basins that are five to 10 meters deep and will tend to go anaerobic is the is the place to really look. Okay, just one final thing on that before moving on. You're an alumnus of the Dorset Environmental Science Center out of which the Lake Partner Program operates. Um, do you think that there's any appetite uh, on the part of, um, of the Ministry of the Environment and the Lake Partner Program folks there, uh, Anna DeSellison and others, to rethink the program in order to, to accommodate uh, what you're just saying and integrate you know, the, the, the new kinds of science and concerns mm -hmm. into the program? So now I have to get a little political, um, <clears throat> which probably won't bother you, Terry. Um, things, <laughs> things are not going that well for the Ministry of the Environment, Dorset Environmental Science Center right now. Um, you know, they've lost a lot of staff. Um, uh, they're no longer supporting a lot of academics, bringing their students to the site, not that they don't want to. Um, the Lake Partner Program, I'm pretty sure, will survive as long as the Dorset Environmental Science Center survives. And you'd have to ask, you know, the, Anna, if she's willing to make any changes and whether she has the wherewithal to do it right now. I suspect the answer is probably no. Um, the, however, um, the ministry is still certainly confirming algal blooms when they're suspected to have occurred. So that part of it can still be done for sure. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to some of the comments and questions, um, other comments and questions in chat. Is there any connection between pesticides um, and algal blooms? And if, or what is the, 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 the impact that pesticides may have on algal blooms or, prevent, or potential conditions you know, causing algal blooms? So here I have to speculate a little bit um, because it's not an area that I've actually worked in. <clears throat> um, I think glyphosate is used uh, to manage tree corridors in Muskoka and something has been used to deal with the bug that used to be called gypsy moth. Um, uh, I don't recommend that. 
Um, forests are incredibly good at managing defoliation on their own. They've been defoliated for tens of thousands of years. We're much better off to not add pesticides. Um, as a general principle, if you're adding something to the environment that is beyond the evolutionary experience of all of the life in that habitat, you're asking for trouble. Um, and a lot of these pesticides are certainly beyond the evolutionary experience of animals. So even though I don't, it's not an area that I've worked, I've worked in a lot of areas on lakes, but I think if you can avoid using pesticides, it's wise. Okay, so we've talked about uh, blue-green algae blooms and, and, and cyanobacteria creating conditions that can be toxic to humans and, and other life. But what makes those blooms toxic? Because not all of them actually release a toxin into, the, into a lake, but what, what turns it or what triggers that toxin to be released? Uh, I think classic, this is an area that I, I might have to go back and look this up again, Terry. It has been well studied by a scientist called Diane Orhill um, for her PhD. I think it has a lot to do with the nitrogen phosphorus ratios in the water. Um, and to my knowledge so far, the algal blooms that we're getting, including the cyanophyte ones, uh, have not been producing toxins but they are species that can. Um, so the species that, you know, that blooms every year in, in Three Mile Lake in Muskoka um, uh, absolutely can produce blooms. The one that bloomed in Algonquin Park absolutely, sorry, can produce toxins. So I think it depends on the ratio of other nutrients as to whether or not they end up producing those toxins. But I recommend whoever asked that question, search the work of Diane Orihel, O-R-I-H-E-L, and she would have a definitive answer to that. Just, just to push you one more place where you may not want to go, um, the uh, information that some of us have been given who are lake stewards and active in trying to, to, uh, to protect water quality in lakes have been told that if you have a cyanobacteria um, bloom that takes place, you will not know whether or not a toxin has been released. And you need to assume that on a basis of a kind of a precautionary principle. Yeah, um, that makes sense to me. And so uh, that's one of the things I wanted you to comment on was whether or not that makes sense as a matter of, 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 of precaution. Um, but how do we, what do we know about how far beyond the actual visible bloom the toxins can spread? So lakes are not passive. Um, if you stand on your dock on a typical summer day and it's a typical amount of wind, then the water will move one to two kilometers over the course of the next day. And so the water that's at your dock tomorrow morning when you go down there was a kilometer or two up the lake the day before. Um, lakes mix horizontally very rapidly under typical windy conditions. Uh, under typical conditions of wind, and then much more rapidly under a storm. So if you have an algal bloom in a modest sized Muskoka or Halliburton Lake, somewhere in the lake, um, you're not safe to drink the water. Okay. And you won't exactly know that until that lake has been tested and you get the results back. And so in the meantime, it's the precautionary principle is the best way to go. Yeah. And, you know, I hate to say this, but people have died. Um, you know, lots of animals have died. It's not widely known that people have died. Uh, there was a case in Brazil, no, it's not typical, where there was a hospital that was drawing water from a reservoir that had an algal bloom that produced toxins um, and all kinds of people that were on dialysis in the hospital were drawing on that water from the reservoir. And even though it was filtered, the toxins that were getting through, and I think it was six people that were killed. Wow, another cautionary tale. Yeah, um, I mean, okay, so um, moving on to some other related questions, there's a comment or there's a question about what the effect of extensive landscaping and the creation of you know sort of manicured lawns around cottages has on the production of of algal blooms. 
And also a subsidiary, a secondary question to that, do Canada geese have any effect? <laughs> um, Canada geese certainly have an effect locally, but I would think the 100,000 people coming up from Toronto every year are, are bringing more phosphorus than the Canada geese that have been here for a thousand years are bringing here. So before you point you know, fingers at the geese, and I know they're a pain in the ass, so to speak, um, you know, make sure that we're ourselves not bringing lots of extra nutrients up and maybe get a neighbor with a, uh, a good active dog to keep the geese away from your beaches. And for God's sakes, don't remove the riparian vegetation because that's, uh, if, as long as it's there, the geese will, will not come. So manicured lawns, um, if they're also fertilized, uh, then that, will not be good. You know, that will lead to extra nutrients getting into the lake for sure. Um, you're better off as a rule of thumb. Oh, I'm trying to remember this number. If you can keep half of the whole watershed completely natural, you'll probably protect all the native biodiversity that's there. Um, and near shores, you want to protect the riparian vegetation and and if you're manicuring a lawn, for God's sakes, don't add fertilizer, um, uh, especially near the lake, because that'll end up in the water. Okay. Now, there's a question I should have put in with a, with the previous question about the uh, the toxicity of of um, of cyanobacteria. But one of the one of the comments here, or the question here, is um, implied. People are suggesting that they filter their water and it goes through a UV light. My information is that that will not actually control the toxin that's in the water. Do you have anything you want to you want to say about that? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, the UV light uh, will kill bacteria. I mean, it's meant to sterilize, not to break down toxins. And the other thing related to that is um, our legs are getting more colored. It's probably natural, but there also might be a bit of a climate change component to that. So the water is getting browner um, naturally. So lakes in Muskoka are about 25% browner um, than they were 20 years ago. Um, and, and UV light doesn't work very well on brown water. Uh, the organ the colored organics in brown water absorb that ultraviolet very, very rapidly. Um, so uh, filtering and ultraviolet um, don't work. What should work on any toxins are uh, charcoal filters, I'm thinking, would probably work. But again, this isn't really an area where I'm an expert. Um, I might actually check with Liz Favo. She might know more about this than me. Okay. Well, if you do check with her and you have something to add, we can well. we can circulate that. Um, so by the way, just as an aside, we are putting together a resource list for people who want to take a deeper dive into some of these, some of these areas. And we um, are also going to include a reference to the study that that Norman has just mentioned by Liz uh, Favot. Um, and, uh, and so that'll be coming out probably tomorrow sometime to everybody who registered for, for this event. And we're also uh, recording tonight's uh, proceedings and, and you will get a copy of the link to the YouTube channel where that's going to be posted um, as soon as we can get our act together on that. Um, there's a question about how calcium can be added to lakes. Um, as it was mentioned, the calcium is being added into Muskoka lakes. I think that she's that's what she's assuming. Yeah, we're not adding the calcium directly to the water because the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks still considers it um, the ash that we're using potentially hazardous. Um, we do know we have to add something because it'll take centuries to maybe millennia for calcium levels to return on their own to the levels before acid rain. What we are doing is adding ash to the landscape to the forest, because the forests also suffer from this loss of half a ton of calcium per hectare. So trees aren't capturing as much carbon, they're not as healthy, they're not as drought resistant, they're not as fire resistant. So we believe in Friends of Muskoka Watershed, 
We should start by protecting the forest. And if we get the forest healthy again, um, the forest will look after the water. It'll capture more phosphorus. It'll uh, capture more spring meltwater. Um, actually, one little take home message is protect the forest and protect the water fleas and then everything else will be okay. <laughs> okay. So we're at, in response, um, if people have, uh, if they heat with wood, then make sure that ash is really cool. And then you can add that ash on your own property at about a 750 yogurt mill yogurt container per square meter. So 700, a, little, a big yogurt container full of ash is enough to completely restore um, all the damage done by acid rain in a square meter of forest soil, and you only have to add it once. You never have to add it again to that spot. Best done under hardwoods because they have the highest demand uh, for calcium and suffered the most from acid rain. Uh, there's a question from Michael Giza about the original logging debris on lakes uh, like um, Dixon, I, I I think that you indicated that there wasn't a whole bunch of industrial logging around Dixon Lake, but was there his, his historic logging in that area that might have been a factor oh. contributing to uh, to alg algal blooms? I'm assuming that that's a great question, and I'm going to have to ask the initial authors of that study. Um, there are very few areas in Algonquin Park that weren't logged. You know, there's a few wonderful old hemlock stands on the Bat Lake Trail, for example. But I assume that that forest would have been logged 100 years ago. Um, and then it's grown back since then. Um, so I'm trying to think of how that might have led to an algal bloom. Um, I'm going to have to give that one some thought. Um, it would have been logged 100 years ago for sure, but but the whole area was logged 100 years ago, and we're not getting algal blooms everywhere. So I wouldn't, my gut feeling here is that the answer to what causes an algal bloom is going to, to some extent, be a lake specific answer. I think the spiny water flea might be involved, calcium decline might be involved, the shape and size of the lake might matter, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Okay. okay, I'm thinking that um, with respect to uh, uh, logging practices, um, you just mentioned Algonquin Park and Dixon. I mean, logging is continuing in Algonquin Park, and I, I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about, and I know that they have buffers around lakes and so on and so forth, but I'm just curious about the ongoing impact that that might have. Well, I will, I will say one thing for sure, and that is that it will contribute to calcium loss. Uh, from lakes because <clears throat> trees themselves are incredibly good at recycling calcium. They don't pull the calcium out of the leaves when the leaves drop in the fall. Um, so there's a huge potential loss of calcium during leaf fall. But the trees secrete about a third of their photosynthate, the sugar, into the rhizosphere, into the rooting zone. And that's to fuel the fungi and bacteria and invertebrates that break down all those leaves and recycle it. So once uh, the trees are incredibly good at holding on to nutrients, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have any forest, right? Um, if all the leaves uh, took all the nutrients away every year and it wasn't restored, after a few leaf falls, there wouldn't be enough nutrients left in our foot of nutrient poor soil to grow our forest. But that's not what happens until logging. So logging removes biomass, obviously, from the forest garden. And every gardener understands that you can continually deplete the nutrient pool without consequence. So multiple, and there's only enough calcium. I'm thinking way back to a university course. Only enough calcium in the forest um, soils to grow the forest, to grow the forest about three times. So if you do, the more you log and remove biomass and then find, uh, remove the slash as well, uh, the harder it's gonna be for that forest to grow back. 
and okay, that so ultimately lead to lower calcium levels in the legs. Okay, and just because uh, there is a, 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 there was a question about just going back and, and reiterating the the reason for the calcium decline in legs. Was there a significant role of for you know, acid rain in 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 depleting the calcium cycle, you know, around our legs as well? Absolutely. Uh, the main reason calcium levels have fallen is because of acid rain. Um, acid rain uh, stripped about half a ton of calcium uh, per hectare from our soils in Muskoka and Halliburton. <clears throat> you know, south of the shield, that doesn't really matter because the limestone restores calcium very quickly in the soil. But up here in Halliburton and Muskoka, except on the Procamian carbonates in that one chain of legs uh, in Halliburton, um, calcium is restored in the soil very, very slowly, uh, centuries to millennia by natural breakdown. And the rain has got cleaner. So we have kind of less dusty rain. Um, like there, there are many good news stories too. Like um, if you compare the chemistry of the rain today with the chemistry 40 years ago, it's much cleaner in terms of contaminants. There's lower lead, lower mercury, lower zinc, lower cadmium, and lower calcium, because there's kind of less dust in the rain. And so uh, there are two phenomena that have led to low calcium. The big one is acid rain, but generally cleaning up emissions and lowering dust input into the into the air has had a small contribution as well. When you see, uh, there was one great example years ago of the importance of occasional massive dust inputs. And that was the tornado that went through Barrie in 1980, uh, it was 1983, I think. And uh, every one of our rain collectors in Dorset was full of dust from Southern Ontario. And so there were literally hundreds or thousands of tons of dust brought up here from the South. Um, and that happens at a global scale. You know, the Amazon rainforest is fueled by dust from the Sahara. <clears throat> but acid rain is the main one. And I have to show my acid rain barbecue sauce bottle. <laughs> and so there was a time in the 80s where acid rain was so much in the news that you could market barbecue sauce called acid rain. Okay. Sandy, I'm going to bring this to the lab. We're going to use it in our marketing. <clears throat> okay, just uh, just to finish that sort of line of thinking about you know, the, I wanted to just ask a question. I may, again, this may be unfair to you, but there's a lot of logging takes place on on Crown land, a significant a part of it. Um, and I, just curious about the relationship to the specific forest management practices yep. and the impact on lake water quality, including including things like calcium levels and 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 uh, and other things. Could you make a comment about about that is, is that something that we should be concerned about and wanting to have uh, a dialogue about the best the best kind of if we're going to have uh, industrial forestry what kind of practices we're going to be less damaging uh, you know to our lakes uh so now i'm going to quote dr sean watma from trent university and actually recommend that you get him as one of your speakers because he more than anyone else has studied um, the the kind of cumulative effect of logging and acid rain on forest health uh, and and sustainable forestry, and it's his conclusion that everything would be okay when our in our forests if we didn't log. But the combination of historical acid rain and logging um, has has led to an unsustainable forest unless we add back the missing nutrients that the um, loggers take out. Now I've had, I'm very sympathetic to the loggers. Um, uh, I was taken out into a, a logging operation by a third generation logger in Dorset who had heard me talk about calcium decline and wanted to know why the trees weren't recovering. 
to the stage that his grandfather remembered. And this is up in the Dwight area. And, and uh, he said, do you think calcium decline might have anything to do with this? And I said, yes. And I said, if you leave the twigs and the branches and the slash in the forest, that would help because they have higher levels of calcium than the, the bowls of the trunks. And he said, we can't do that. He said, our um, profit margins are so slim that we need to sell everything. And then I said, well, you inherited this business from your grandfather, but if you want your grandchildren to also be logging in Muskoka, then you're going to have to you're going to have to start behaving more like a gardener and less like a miner. You know, uh, all gardeners understand that you can take out more nutrients. You can continue to remove nutrients unless they're being added in some other way. In as I said, in southern Ontario, on thick, nutrient-rich soils, you can garden for a long time without worrying about that, probably, but not in Muskoka and Halbert, where we only have a a foot of nutrient poor soil that can only be logged two or three times before there isn't enough nutrients left to grow the forest back. So Friends Muskoka Watersheds Ash Project is one way to do that because uh, we're restoring the uh, a bunch of nutrients in the, in the soil in, in ratios that are appropriate because um, the nutrients all came from burning that wood in the first place. And then you burn off the carbon and the oxygen that was in water and CO2, but you're left with the nutrients that were in the soil, um, with the exception of nitrogen, which also burns off. But here is where we have a little bit of pollution fortune, not misfortune. And that's that a third of all of our acid rain was nitric acid not sulfuric acid. And so our soils have lots of nitrogen in Muskoka. They wouldn't have had a hundred years ago, but they do now. And so you can use ash, even though it has low nitrogen to restore forest health. Hmm. Okay, so there's a, just a comment again from Michael Giza about um, some information that he had. He read that uh, the lower end of Lake Laval, which, which, fall, which uh, flows into Dixon, apparently, there was a, a, a sawmill that left meters of bark and sawdust that flowed into Dixon, which I, I, which he says is a relatively shallow lake. Um, and we have lakes in Halliburton, which have had similar logging debris. Is, is that in any way connected to the to the, the the nutrient deficiencies that were showing up in the lakes? Well, it could. Um, well, first of all, to point out is that it was the first ever bloom, right? Uh, in, in, even though that, that pile of logging waste has probably been there for a century, it's the first time apparently the lake bloomed, so maybe not. But on the other hand, it would add um, biological oxygen demand to deep waters, and so it might make the deep water more vulnerable to anoxia. So it might have been, who knows, you know, a combination of accumulated bark debris and that incredibly calm summer um, that might have led to the development of anoxia. It's going to be a bit lake specific, um, which is why I'm not, you know, holding my hat on any particular theory. But I'm going to go back to Liz's paper and see if she mentions that. And I thank um, Michael Lizard for pointing that out. Okay. So, um, there are a couple of people who are just wanting to nail down about how to best to report algal blooms, you know, and so that so that we can trace whether or not they're toxic and and so on and so forth. What's the best way to do that? Um, that's interesting because I've never done it. The local health unit are the people. I see Sandy nodding, so that's good. So it's local health units. That, uh, that you make the reports to, and then they would send a sample uh, to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to confirm whether or not it actually is a cyanophyte bloom. Uh, and they also do the uh, testing to see if there's a toxin there. But something has happened recently that I find a little disturbing, and that's that health units are not making uh, the determinations public anymore. So you won't quite know what 
necessarily what lake has had one of these cyanophyte blooms. I, I should also say that in, in uh, our neck of the woods with the Halliburton Kawartha Pine Ridge Health Unit, they no longer uh, are part of that cycle or that circle. Uh, lake stewards and others are having to directly involve the Ministry of the Environment in trying to determine right. whether or not cyanobacteria is present or toxins are present. And they are also no longer involved in notifying residents that a that a a, 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 a blue green algae bloom is on the lake and and i know that that may vary from one pine one health unit to the other i noticed that i think that the muskoka the the simcoe muskoka health unit is still involved in that process but it's but the pine ridge um halliburton kawartha lakes one is not and so that's a, a it seems to me a gaping hole yeah. in, in in the accountability cycle because People need to know if a bloom has has formed on their lake because it, in fact, could have toxins that, as you pointed out, can have a very direct effect on them as well as the um, other animals, including their pets. So, so I, I see our, Sandy wants to say something, but let me just point out that I still don't know what a good definition of a bloom is. But we're, you know, you can have a small local area that got a little bit of phosphorus and has a little bit of green soup. It might cover 50 feet of shoreline. That's not quite what we're talking about here. We're talking about these large expanses that are really of concern. Can I invite Sandy to say sure, that? Absolutely. Sandy, do you want to you want to chime in on that? Yeah, just it, our health unit does say to contact the ministry. That's oh, who you're okay. supposed to contact the ministry. They have a, a way online or by phone. But our health unit will also help you through health connections about your concerns about the water and things like that. So report it to the ministry, but you can get more information from our health unit also. When you say our health unit, you mean the Simcoe Muskoka health unit? Yeah, so that's what Simcoe Muskoka does. So I'm okay. assuming the others would be similar. They rec they direct you to the ministry, MECP, um, by phone or online. But if you have questions about the health-related pieces of drinking water and stuff like that, it looks like they'll support you. Okay. Anybody have anything else you want to add to that? Jim, do you want to say anything about your experience in reporting algal blooms? Jim Prince? Uh, sure. Jim Prince, um, uh, we have a place on Kinesis, and I'm part of the Kinesis Lake Cottage Owners Association of VP and Stewardship. Um, we've been reporting uh, harmful algal blooms for a while, and we really don't have anybody in Halliburton that's taken up the flag to do this. We have an ad hoc committee that's uh, attempting to get someone to take accountability for that, including the health unit. Uh, we've been reporting it on a regular basis to the municipalities where it, occur where it occurs in Halliburton County. And there are really good uh, exemplars out there. BC has one for citizen science reporting uh, in the US. Um, there's all kinds of good exemplars for that. So I think it's important for us to start that now in the next little while. If anybody's interested, uh, reach out to me. You can get my contact information from Susan, and uh, we can start a reporting program in Halliburton County, at least initially, and then try and encourage some level of either uh, municipal, county, or health unit government to try and get that working and communicate back out to the areas where harmful algal blooms occur. Okay, so I take it what you're saying is that your experience with the Ministry of the Environment, uh, Conservation and Parks is that they're really overloaded uh, and that they have not got the kind of capacity to respond in a in a in a more direct way. Uh, that that's what used to happen, I think. And I think we're getting better response from the ministry, uh, but they are not. And I don't think it's their job to take responsibility to go back to the communities to warn them about harmful algal blooms. Um, they record it, they track it, but then it needs to be somebody in our local area that could warn community members that there's a harmful algal bloom on their lakes. It's really dumped down to the lake associations. Okay, and uh, just a final comment in chat. Um, uh, Vanessa Lithgow says that Lithgow says that um, you know there is a spills line on the Ministry of of Environment and Cl and Conservation and Parks website, and that's where you 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 can report. Uh, algal blooms to that website. Um, I, I think part of our experience has been is you need to make sure you follow up because 
sometimes right. you know they, you know they they're challenged in terms of capacity yeah um, that that's correct we've been we've actually been really successful with that reporting method uh you do need a follow up but it doesn't get back to the community that there has been a, a harmful algal bloom okay i think that i'm going to leave it at that i don't see anything in chat that we haven't really covered in one way or the other so Susan, I think I'll, I'll I'll call it a night on that and turn it back over to you for some final thanks. Okay, thanks, Terry. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Yan very much for his fascinating presentation. And we're very lucky that Dr. Yan has no plans to actually retire <laughs> in the near, near future. Um, so I would like to announce that Environment Halberton has tentatively arranged a speaker for Tuesday, November the 14th to talk about addressing the housing crisis while ensuring the protection of natural areas and farmland. However, this is yet to be confirmed. Um, if you aren't already on the Environment Halbert MailChimp list and would like to be kept informed of our events, please send me an email at environment, or sorry, info at environmenthalberton.org. Better yet, become a member of Environment Halberton by going to the memberships and do donations page of our website at www.environmenthalberton.org. And thanks to everyone for attending our event this evening, and we appreciate your support. Good night and be well.